Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes, giving some people a chance to log in. Um, my name is Emily Vandermeer. I'm a communication specialist with WWF Canada's Nature Connected Communities team, and I will be your MC today. You may notice we've been running a poll just to get to know you a little bit better to see where you are from, if this is the first webinar that you've attended, and whether you are currently part of WWF's In the Zone gardening program. Okay, great. So we'll get started. Um, for those of you who haven't attended one of our past webinars, we started our Garden for Wildlife series to give you the dirt on native plant gardening so that together we can grow Canada's largest wildlife garden. This is our sixth webinar in this series. Um, and so far it's been our most popular one yet. And I can imagine why after all of the planning, digging, maintaining and monitoring of your garden, you finally get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's right, today we are going to be talking about edible native plants. Native plants aren't only for wildlife, we can grow gardens that feed bees, birds, butterflies, and other backyard critters, and also fill our own plates. So, as I mentioned, this is one of our last webinars, but we do have one more coming up on Tuesday. We will be joined by Dr. Doug Ptolemy. Um, he is the author of Bringing Nature Home. His book awakened readers to the urgent situation that wildlife populations are in decline because of the native plants that they depend on are fast disappearing. So on Tuesday, he'll be talking about his new book, Nature's Best Hope, and how you can turn your green space into a conservation corridor that provides wildlife habitat. So you can register for these webinars on wwf.ca or also the In the Zone Gardens website. You can see the URL on your screen. Also, if you have missed past webinars and you wanna catch up on them, we have been posting them on YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com slash WWF Canada, you can review the past webinars and we will also be posting this one online about 48 hours after. Okay, and I'm just gonna check out the poll here and to get a sense of where everybody is from. So as you can see, most of you are joining us from Ontario, but we have people online who are from BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec. We have some people from the East Coast, and we also have a cohort of you joining us from outside of Canada, which is so awesome. Thank you for joining us today. Great, so I'd also just like to tell you a little bit about what In the Zone is. So WWF Canada and Carolinian Canada came together to work on this program. So it is a community made up of thousands of gardeners in um, Southern Ontario's Carolinian zone who are growing native plants. And by doing so, they're helping us grow Canada's largest wildlife garden. And we also have some really exciting news to share. In the Zone has partnered with Loblaw to source native plants for 35 of their garden centers across Southern Ontario. So these plants have been carefully selected by native plant growers and they will make excellent habitat for pollinators and other wildlife in your garden. So we know that buying plants for your garden is going to look a little bit different this year, but Loblaw garden centers are open and employing physical distancing measures. So like most other grocery stores, they're urging customers to come in once a week or less. So consider planning ahead and adding native plants to your weekly shopping list and get them at the same time. So as you can see in the picture here, we have a special in the zone garden tag that you can find on these plants. And when you see that, you can ensure that you are choosing plants that are native to where you live and will help local wildlife thrive. If you're interested in finding out where these plants are, you can visit the inthezonegardens.ca website and we will have a list of the stores that are carrying the tag. And lastly, before I get to introducing our experts, just some quick housekeeping. We will be doing a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please put your questions into the Q&A box and we'll be able to get to those at the end. So you might see some of our panelists answering your questions during the presentation. 
And you may also see them flagging some of your questions as answer live, which means that we'll be answering those ones at the end during the live Q&A. We are going to do our best to get to everybody's questions, but we know that might not be possible. So we will, at the end of the webinar series, be putting together a list of commonly asked questions and sending out the answers. So let's get started. I am delighted to introduce you to our panel today. We have Lorraine Johnson and Ryan Godfrey with us. Ryan is WWF's resident botanist and on the board of the North American Native Plant Society. And Lorraine Johnson is the author of numerous books on native plant gardening, including the 100 Easy to Grow Native Plants for Canadian Gardens. She's also currently co-writing a book on native plants for pollinators and also writes about urban agriculture and growing food in our cities, including edible plants. So without further ado, I'd like to pass this over to you, Ryan, get us started. Yeah, thanks very much for that intro, Emily. Um, so we'll, I'll just start by um, going through the topics for today's webinar and then we'll get right into it. I know you guys wanna see some delicious stuff and I promise we've got that at the end for you. So we're gonna start off really quickly with some context about why native plants. I know if you've seen webinars in this series before, this will be familiar to you. So I'm gonna get through it real quick, I promise. Then we're gonna do a little bit of context about what we are and are not talking about today in this webinar. And then just a little bit of context about what a native plant food garden can be. There are different ways to do it. And sort of, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. The bulk of this presentation, I promise you, is gonna be pretty pictures of plants, delicious edible plants that you will love to grow in your garden. We're also gonna talk about um, organizing those plants by habitat type. So some of the plants that work really well together and how you can get a harvest from your native plant garden throughout the year. And we're gonna close off with some delicious recipes. Um, and then we'll just talk about our, our closing remarks and give you some resources and next steps. All right, next slide, please. We're just clicking through those things. Nice little animation there. Okay, definitions, always good to start off on the same page. So to me, a garden is any place where plants grow and people care for them. Very broad definition. Next definition, ecology, the study of the relationships between living organisms and their non-living environment. Next one, just to keep in mind, ecological restoration, assisting in the recovery of degraded or destroyed ecosystems for the benefit of both humans and nature. That's where we're included in that, okay? Stewardship, the responsible use and protection of the natural environment through conservation and sustainable practices. Next, to keep in mind, native plants, everybody asks me this all the time, what the heck are they? They are the regional flora that has evolved in your place for thousands of years. They're adapted to local conditions and co-evolved with all those other organisms. And there really is no replacing that. There's no other substitution. You gotta get those native plants. All right, next one is habitat, any area that contains the features essential for the life cycle needs of an organism, not just food, but also shelter and you know, a place for them to reproduce, all of that. Next up, we have a botanist, that's me, a student or expert in the study of uh, any kinds of plants, AKA plant nerd. And again, I'm your personal plant nerd for the next little while and Lorraine too, of course. <laughs> and then I added one here, um, which is horticulture. So that is the art or practice of garden cultivation and management. And you would think that botany and horticulture necessarily go like this, but they don't always. I will tell you, I know a lot of botanists who don't, don't know how to actually care for plants. And it, it's, it's a separate skill set. happens to be one that I've been cultivating myself and one that Lorraine is an absolute master at. So very glad to have her to help out today with those types of questions. All right, next slide, please, Emily. So we're gonna go through this real quick. Why are we talking about native plants again? Okay, next slide. So you've heard us talk before about the dual crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change. You've heard us talk about how in ecology, everything is linked. So as one of these crises advances, the other one does as well. 
You may have heard us talk about nature-based solutions. Those are the solutions that benefit both of these crises simultaneously. It really comes down to um, protecting and main maintaining and restoring natural carbon sinks, which are also habitat for wildlife. And a lot of that comes down to putting plants in the ground. Next slide, please. So, of course, we're in a third crisis right now as well. And I love this quote from Emma Gilchrist. I just keep coming back to it, that community scale solutions are going to be really important for us in this coronavirus pandemic. And that now is a really good time to reevaluate our priorities and maybe think about shifting some things around, okay? Keep that in mind. Next slide, please. You've probably seen this map before of the Carolinian zone. This is characteristic of lots of different places across Canada and outside of Canada, where green spaces, functioning habitats are declining. It's a low proportion of, of the overall area. And we need to increase that. So we of course need to protect the remnants, but we also need to restore and enhance across all land use types. And that absolutely includes your gardens. Next slide, please. The solution lies in ecology. So this, again, is the science of the relationships of organisms and their non-living environments. It's a very complicated science, but all you really need to know is that the basic principle of ecological restoration is you put native plants in the ground. You take the plants, you put it in the ground, everything gets better, I promise. <laughs> Next slide, please. That's it, native plants. This is what ecological restoration typically looks like. Next slide. When we get into human dominated landscapes, it gets a little bit more complicated, but the principle is the same. You get the native plants, you put them in the ground. <laughs> Next slide, please. When you get into a habitat, an ecology like this, we're gonna have to think real hard and real deep about how to get those native plants in there, but I do believe that we can do it. And I'm, I'm sending that challenge out to everyone in the audience right now. 194 people are gonna put their heads together to figure out how to get native plants into a place like this. I think we can do it. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we know that we're doing it right? we're gonna measure it using biodiversity. That's the number of species. So how many plants, how many insects, how many fish, how many birds? The, the more your ecosystem is functioning, the more species you will find in there. And that is a wonderful thing because we can reverse biodiversity loss in this manner. But that's not all. We're also looking at ecosystem services. So these are the things that we get out of nature. They have a dollar value associated with them. And one of those very most important ones is food. You could eat food <laughs> and you might not have to go to the grocery store quite as often. And, and that is a service that is you will be benefiting from in your restored ecosystem garden. Finally, the third aspect that is really important about functioning ecosystems is connectivity. That means connectivity between patches, between ecosystems, but also I think there's an opportunity for gardens to connect people and neighborhoods um, of all different types through our shared interests in our natural landscape. So the, the question is that you should be asking yourself is what can your green space do? And it should be doing many, many different things all at once. Next slide. So just remind yourself every time you're looking at your green space or your garden and wondering, what should I do next? It can be doing all of these things all at once. Um, and, and if it's doing that, and if all of us are doing that, then we're saving the world and we're on the right track. So with that, next slide, let's get into the edible stuff. So I'm passing over to Lorraine, next slide. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. Yeah, so as Ryan said, this uh, presentation is about uh, growing edible native plants in your garden um, so that you can harvest these plants to eat and at the same time you can create this amazing wildlife habitat and many of these plants are not available um, as food sorry as food in the grocery store like you can't just go and buy a wild ginger root at the grocery store but you can grow it in your garden to eat um, so um, 
what this what this presentation is not about is it's uh, not about um, foraging, um, although we definitely want to acknowledge Indigenous sovereignty and the inherent right of Indigenous people to um, uh, to wild harvest and to, to manage that harvest as sovereign people. Um, but uh, we, won't, we won't be talking about that. We're talking, we're focusing uh, completely on growing these plants in your garden. Um, next slide, please. We do know that we're only scratching the surface of the many, many native edible plants that you could grow. Um, and maybe we'll get into some of the other ones in the Q&A that we don't cover in this presentation. But we're trying to stick to plants that are pretty much um, easy to find in nurseries, so you can buy them. Um, we're, we're also um, not gonna focus on some, some plants need a lot of processing to be edible, like oaks, which are amazing for wildlife. They're great trees for pollinators, but to har harvest those acorns and turn them into a flower, it takes a lot of work, a lot of processing. So we're not, we're not focusing on that. We're focusing on plants that are pretty easy to um, harvest for their edible feature. We're avoiding um, plants with poisonous parts. So in the middle there, the photo of the pokeweed. Some people do in fact eat pokeweed shoots at a very young stage, but if you get any bit of the root in that, if you harvest it, like it's toxic. All plants, or all, most parts of that plant are toxic, so except those young shoots that some people eat. So we're not including those. Um, and some plants, you know, they do, of, of these native edible plants, are kind of an acquired taste. Um, on the photo on the left there, the high bush cranberry. Some people think it's the most disgusting fruit ever. It's sour and it's smelly when you cook it. Um, so we're, we're really sticking to some kind of universally loved um, native edible plants. Um, we would just like to say exercise caution for sure. Um, when Because many of these plants, like these might be some of the first times you've ever eaten them and, you know, you, um, who knows, like you might have some reaction or something. So try a little bit first before you just dive right in. We, we do urge um, caution. Uh, we've also, we focus very much on a vigorous plants that you can harvest a bit and they'll still come back next year. So um, we'll talk more about that in, the, in, in each plant. Okay, next slide, please. Ryan. Okay, yeah. I uh, just wanted to say uh, that acquired taste that reminds me of a story. My, one of my first botanical mentors um, in university she used to talk about plants that whenever she said I learned oh that that makes a really great jam what she really meant was it does not taste very good <laughs> and you have to add a whole lot of sugar before uh, that becomes remotely edible so a little bit of a code word there for folks but okay so I did want to mention here a different kind of food garden so we've got a picture here of one of my favorite places in the whole wide world which is the Alex Wilson Community Garden in downtown Toronto. And this is a good example for me of a fusion garden, what I would call a fusion garden. So on the left hand side, you have um, a native plant garden and a lovely shady woodland type garden. And on the right side, you have community garden plots where people grow food and they grow ornamental plants and some native plants too, but mostly those things are kind of separate. Um, and that's fine. That's a perfectly acceptable way to grow a garden and we will encourage that and we'll come back to um, fusion gardens a little bit later. But for the most part, what we're talking about here are actually edible plants that are native plants. So they are food for, for wildlife, for pollinators, they are restoring nature, and they're also edible for us humans at the same time. So just I don't think there's a better or a worse thing here. It's just two different ways of doing it. And you can do both things at the same time. There's no, no problem with that. Next slide, please. So if you are going in the route of edible native plants, you will find that some things are harvested in a familiar kind of way, like the sunchoke on the left, um, which really harvests, you know, I mean, the plant doesn't look anything like a potato, but when you harvest it, it's kind of potato-like. You dig it up, you get a whole bunch of stuff out of the ground, and then you can plant some of those back so that they will come back next year, but mostly it's sort of an annual harvest type thing. Some other things, like in the middle, we have this sassafras. That's a tree. That's a big tree, and you're going to be harvesting possibly leaves from that to make a tea or possibly 
um, chunks of the root to make infusions, or, or maybe you'll use um, a pulverized form of the leaf to make filet, which is used to thicken stews like in a gumbo. So that's a pretty different way of harvesting a plant. And then you might have something like, again, that high bush cranberry that um, maybe you decide to harvest it, or maybe you decide to leave a bunch of it for the birds, and it's sort of up to you, but really it's just a, a wonderful shrub that you will appreciate as a plant. Um, and then you will realize that, you know, maybe you do want to harvest a little bit from it too for yourself. It's, it's fully up to you. Next slide, please. But the point of that being, it's unlikely to look like a typical kitchen garden where you have, you know, sort of rows of herbs um, that you're going to be harvesting on a particular schedule. This, it, it, that is more of the fusion garden type of thing. And uh, our, this, this, these types of plants are gonna be harvested a slightly different sort of way. So now we'll get right into the plants and we have organized them by edible feature. So next slide, please. Um, this is my favorite botanical illustration that exists. And I'm so glad that I got to put it in this presentation. <laughs> um, it, this is a made up plant that does not actually exist in real life, but it was dreamed up um, by a botanist and philosopher by the name Goethe, um, a German, and he imagined a plant that had all the possible variation of plant morphological and anatomical features, but all on one plant instead of being on lots of different types of plants. And it serves a really cool purpose because I can show you, um, this is sort of a cross section of that plant, that imaginary plant. Imagine you cut it in half lengthwise all the way down to the root. So you can see all the different ways that roots can grow into tubers and rhizomes and corms and all of those things that we're not going to distinguish in this presentation, but they're just different adaptations, different ways that plants grow their roots. And in the middle, you can see all sorts of different ways that plants um, arrange their leaves and shoots. And then up at the top, just a reminder folks that the flowers and the fruits are the same part of a plant and they are the re reproductive parts of that plant. So that is the way that the plant is reproducing. And I just always like to remind people that when you're eating a fruit, that is a mature ovary. That is, that is what that is. You're, you're, it's the equivalent of a pregnant belly and, that's, and you're eating it. And the plant wants you to eat that too, just so you know. It's, <laughs> so um, next slide, please. So this is how we're going to arrange things starting from the ground up. So we're starting with these, um, these plants here, ginger and sunchoke. So, so Lorraine, why don't you talk to us a little bit about wild ginger, your experience with that plant? Yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, woodland ground cover plants. It's fantastic. It spreads pretty quickly. It needs good, rich woodland soil. But the great thing about this, the edible feature of this plant is that the root um, actually taste, and it's technically a rhizome, but as uh, Ryan said, we're not going to really distinguish these terms too much here in this talk, but the, um, the, the rhizome has a ginger flavor. It's really delicious and you can, I've cooked it, um, I've, I've cut it up, I've cut up the root and uh, cooked it with peas, delicious in the spring. Like what a, like what a spring dish, you know, wild ginger root and peas. Um, you can also candy it. You can candy the root. Um, I, if you eat meat, um, you can also chop it up and um, use the root with chicken. Put it in the in the middle of let's say a chicken breast and cook it that mm. way but one of the other great things about wild ginger is you know how we're talking about you can feed yourself with these features of these plants and you can feed wildlife one of the really cool things about wild ginger see that flower this maroon flower it's very close to the ground and when the that plant when the plant goes to seed the seed has something on it called an eliasome which is an ant snack it's this like really rich oily attachment to the seed that ants take the seed and they eat the eliasome and they take it away and they plant the seed somewhere else uh, far away from the or relatively far away from the parent plant so that's anyway one of the cool things about how you can feed yourself and feed wildlife with these plants yeah totally and i would say sunchoke is another great example of that because the above ground part of the plant is a sunflower it's in the sunflower genus and um at least for me, I've found that sunflowers are such great 
food sources for bees. They're always covered in bees in my garden. And so throughout the year, you're going to have this enormous sunflower thing that is fairly spready, by the way. So if you're in close quarters, you know, just be aware that this is the kind of plant that will um, take up space. <laughs> you might consider putting it in a container, for example, um, or, you know, just aggressively harvesting it every year so that it, it's, you can keep it in check. But um, I showed that photo a little bit earlier from um, our colleague Pete's garden where he harvested it um, and you end up this one this little harvest here is from I actually did grow it in a container on my balcony and I got this harvest in one year um, which I made into a delicious dish that I will show you a little bit later in the presentation but they're they're potato like in texture but um, have like a creamy nutty sort of extra flavor to them that I just love and um, I need more of it really I, I just I, I should plant some more of this plant. <laughs> Okay, next slide, please. We're sticking with below ground parts and we're moving to the onion family. So Lorraine, tell us about wild leek. Yeah, this is an amazing plant. It sends up the flower first, very early in spring, then the flower disappears and then it sends up these incredible uh, leaves, which are oniony and delicious. And um, you need really good woodland soil for this plant. Um, it's slow growing and um, there are actually concerns about wild harvest of this plant. So I really encourage you to grow it in your garden and to create the conditions that it requires, which means, you know, creating a really good rich woodland soil. So, you know, uh, leaving dead leaves over the winter in the garden to break down and improve your soil. Um, now, the, um, the great thing about this plant is, so you can eat all parts, you can pickle the, you can pickle the roots, you can um, eat the flowers, you can um, eat the leaves, you can make them into a, a pesto, you can pickle the bulbs, you can wrap, let's say, sausages, if you eat meat, you can wrap those and, it, with the leaves and grill them. So uh, it is a really fabulous woodland edible plant and probably one of the better known ones. Yeah, yeah. Also called wild, wild ramps sometimes too, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, and I see a comment already about how the popularity of this plant has led to its near extirpation from certain places in the wild. And again, just reinforcing, that's why we're not talking about wild foraging here. We're talking about growing the plant for yourself um, and for your friends and family that you can share it. You can harvest as much as you like if you've grown it your own self. <laughs> um, so on the other hand, uh, so another member of the onion family that grows really, really well is um, nodding wild onion one of my absolute favorites um, this one does grow in shallow soil conditions sunny ones um, including alvars which are those those special habitats that have just a, a couple centimeters of soil so they're a great um, choice for container gardens or places where um, you just don't have very great soil and just like the um, the wild leeks they come up really early you can start this this picture um, sort of in the center here. I actually took that in mid-April. It was already coming up in my community garden pot and I, I took a little handful of it, brought it home and chopped it up for some scrambled eggs. And it just adds a nice little, it's basically exactly like growing chives. If you already grow chives or green onions in your garden, this is maybe the simplest um, switch over from a, a typical cultivated um, vegetable over to a native plant and you will almost not even notice the difference until it flowers and then you get these lovely drooping umbels um, which I love and and when the when bumblebees pollinate this plant they sort of hang underneath and and squirm around it is very cute to watch so uh, that's a really good one highly recommend um, for any beginner as well next slide please more below ground, I believe. We're staying underground because there's so much good stuff to eat underground. Oh, now this is a plant that I'm fascinated by. I have never grown it myself, but I'm just gonna listen to Lorraine as she explains. <laughs> yeah, it is an amazing plant. Unusual, you don't, uh, um, I guess, uh, 
you don't see it often in native plant gardens and yet I think more people should be growing it because it's fabulous in uh, shady areas, part shady areas. It's a beautiful uh, twining vine so you can use it in all sorts of different ways. It's a fast grower. It's also leguminous so that means it fixes nitrogen in the soil so it actually improves the soil as it grows. And look at that flower. Like what an interesting, um, you can tell it's in the, in the pea family by the shape of the flower. So beautiful and interesting. And then what's great about it as well from an edible point of view is the tubers that you can see there in the photo. They're like potatoes and you can cook them like potatoes. Wash and peel them and roast them and they have this incredibly um, sweet flavor. Um, now don't eat them raw. Um, but they're actually, they've got really um, uh, high, uh, higher than most vegetables uh, uh, and certainly other potatoes, a high protein um, content and um, calcium and iron. So really good. And also you can eat the, the seeds and the young seed pods. They're also edible. And I guess the best time to harvest the tubers is in the fall. But a really interesting plant. And obviously don't, don't harvest risk at all if you want it to come back. It is a perennial plant, so it'll come mm -hmm. back year after year if you leave some of those tubers in the ground, but you can harvest a couple. And I guess that we should, uh, I don't think we've mentioned yet that like these plants and these, this edible native plant garden, you're not going to feed yourself, you know, in the way, as Ryan said earlier, you would in a, like in a food, uh, you know, a turning it totally over to food crops, but you can get these really unusual plants and these special flavors, like it's a celebration of the region and our special zone when you grow these plants and when you uh, maybe cook them. Yeah, totally. Next yeah, slide. Um, next slide, yeah. I just wanted to make a quick note. I was reminded in looking at these photo credits, I wanted to tell people that um, I got many of these photos off of iNaturalist actually. And so if you, um, if you were present for our episode number five, all about citizen science, we spent a bunch of time talking about iNaturalist and just, just emphasizing that, you know, these are just regular people like all of you in the audience who went out, took pictures of plants, posted them under Creative Commons licenses on the internet, and, and now we're able to use them and share them with you. And I just think that's a really cool aspect of citizen science that maybe we didn't cover in episode five. So um, just wanted to bring it back to that. Okay, meanwhile, we're moving up above ground now to um, structures of the stems and leaves that are edible. And we're also, we have our one featured non-flowering plant here, a fern, the ostrich fern. What do you, what do you think about that one, Lorraine? Yeah, um, another very familiar, so unlike some of the earlier plants we've been talking about that are a bit, um, you know, you rarely hear about ground nut, for example, but ostrich fern, the fiddlehead fern, you um, hear about it a lot, you see it in stores, that is one that you can buy fiddleheads, but why not grow them? The ostrich fern, it's fabulous as a spreading um, ground cover in, in uh, shady conditions, part shade conditions, and those beautiful fiddleheads as they emerge, they're starting to emerge right now, and as they unfurl in the garden, it's so beautiful. You can harvest them uh, at this young age when they're just starting to unfurl. You can see in the photo there, um, the small photo of the, the curled up um, uh, fiddleheads. Um, so uh, don't harvest all of them though, you know, because then you won't have any of them unfurl into fronds to, um, to grow in the garden. So um, mm. just harvest a few. And the other important thing about uh, fiddlehead ferns is be sure um, to cook them long enough. They can actually, like don't, don't just sort of parboil quick, quickly to have them crunchy. Uh, that can really uh, um, cause gastric problems. So cook them, you know, like I know it sounds like overcooking, but like cook them for like 10 or 15 minutes. I know that, yeah, they get a bit mushy, but if, um, if you don't want any gastric problems. Cool, good stuff. And then the Virginia water leaf. I mean, this is such a lovely plant. I'm growing it as well. It's one of these extra tough ones with uh, these beautiful flowers that come up quite early in, in the spring. And it's a little bit spready too. Forms a, a beautiful ground cover type thing. Um, but this is one of those where I almost feel like harvesting it may be necessary to prevent it from um, taking over your entire garden. But I have to say, I have to admit, I have never harvested mine. So what would I do with this plant, Lorraine? Well, you would um, 
cut up, the cut the stems and the leaves, the young stems and leaves. This is another feature of many of the above ground um, uh, uh, edible parts of plants. It's actually most of them you want to harvest when they're young. Uh, as they get older, they get kind of bitter or tough. They're not as good, but the young leaves and stems of water leaf are really delicious. You can uh, boil them almost like a spinach, change the water a couple of times, um, cook them for about five to ten minutes, uh, and they're very delicious. And as Ryan said, this is actually a really good way to control a very aggressive plant. Good, but good. an aggressive plant that is fabulous for pollinators. Absolutely, yep. So this will be an important one to really um, take those photos early in spring so you can figure out what it looks like when it's just coming up because um, it won't really reveal its true form until it's already maybe too big to to be um, edible and it might have gotten bitter by that stage. So next slide please. Sticking with stems and leaves. Yeah and another um, uh, plant to harvest the young shoots. It's uh, the false Solomon seal. Um, you can actually eat the young shoots either um, raw, like you can cut them up and put them in salads, or you can cook it like asparagus and it's actually um, kind of similar. Uh, and the great thing is false Solomon seal um, can be a kind of pretty spready plant. You know, Ryan was talking earlier about some of the code words we use. So a uh, vigorous plant so it might be code for very aggressive. Mm. Um, but anyway, it, it's certainly not in all conditions. It really depends on your garden. But if mm -hmm. it is um, spreading a lot, you, the one way you can control it is to harvest those young shoots of some of them mm -hmm. and either have them raw in salads or cooked like asparagus. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and the fireweed on the right, another very, um, it's a pioneering plant. It's a pioneer plant. So it's one that will appear in meadows after some kind, or after some kind of disturbance. Uh, that's where it got its name, fireweed, you know, following fires. It's one of the first plants to um, appear. So very uh, successful as a plant spreader. Um, and this one, you can also eat those young shoots like asparagus. You could cook them and you can have the young leaves. You could cook them like a spinach. Um, you can also, with this plant, you can have the, the um, older leaves, the more mature leaves and the flower. You can dry them and make a tea out of them. Oh, great. Yeah, wonderful. And I just wanted to say too that, um, so the, of the Solomon seals, the the large false Solomon seal probably does like more of a, a rich woodland type habitat, would you agree? But yeah. there's another species, the star flowered false Solomon seal, which um, is an alvar specialist. So it grows in those shadier spots in those rocky alvars. So that's one that's on my list for container gardening, especially if you've got like a north facing balcony um, with not a lot of sun. I, I think that's maybe your plant um, if those are your conditions. So next slide, please. Okay, oh, here's another one of our, our lovely legumes. And I can't put a fine enough point on how important this is. It's really quite a magical thing that beans can do and hardly any other plants do it where they're taking nitrogen from the air and putting it into the ground, which I mean, that's what we're doing when we're fertilizing our soil, right? So. Um, Th these guys are helping you fertilize. It's really, if food is an important or soil health is an important thing to you, you need to have these leguminous plants. Um, and here's another great example of it. So what do I do with this plant, Lorraine? Well, this, uh, this is another sort of vigorous um, twining vine that will kind of grow up, all, you know, twine um, and grow up other plants and uh, or run along the ground um, of woods. It's sort of a woodland plant, but you can put it in sun as well. Um, sun or shade likes a bit of moisture. Um, but what's really amazing about it, it has, this has two really interesting edible features. So in the summer, when the flowers uh, become the fruit, um, it's a fleshy kind of seed pod. Um, it, so it has seeds in it, but you can cook it like beans. So but then some of the flowers actually flower at ground level and um, the flower at the ground level produces this single um, kind of seeded pod um, and it's like a peanut. You can eat it, you can eat it raw, you can cook it and it's just that, um, it's like a nut really, but at ground level. So very interesting plant. Again, not, not one that you see 
grown in gardens very often, but one that I think more people should uh, think about growing if you've got, I mean, it's very, it's very versatile and um, it's a good, it grows well, grows quickly. That's good. All right, let's head to the next slide. I think we're heading into flowers, edible flowers. Yes, it's true, folks. Um, I'll start by talking about violets. Among my absolute favorite um, native plants, there are many different species of violets available. One of my personal favorites is the common blue violet. It's pictured here on the right, um, just because it, it does have that um, vivacious, capacity to to spread and and fill in spaces and its flowers are um, these lovely blue things it's, it's one of the first little pops of color that you'll get in your garden and of course visited by lots of pollinators early in the season and what you can do is just pop those little things off they've got a little bit of nectar at the base and sprinkle them on top of a salad you'll look like a professional chef your friends will think that you are a genius and really all you did was just um you know, have a little garden harvest. Um, over in the center here, this other species is Canada violet. So most, there are yellow violets, white violets, and purpley blue violets, and all are available. If you grow um, a combination of them, I could imagine a very exciting salad with <laughs> a bunch of different colors in it. Um, and then similarly, so we've got red bud as well. So t tell us about red bud. Yeah, well, if you mention um, really beautiful, uh, exciting salads, um, this is something I do with the red bud flowers, which appear in early spring and are so beautiful. I actually harvest flowers from this tree and uh, put them in salads. And it's almost, it is like having this burst of, of nectar and spring with, with a little bit of almost tang to it. It's a it's a wonderful flower and it just you know it announces spring because it blooms so early and this is an amazing tree the red bud is an amazing tree for um bumblebees so it is covered in bees in the early spring so you can also eat you can see so this it produces these um seed pods as well um and the ones in the photo are kind of dried later in the season but when they're very young when they just appear and not all trees produce them. I have two different red buds, two red buds in my yard and one of them will uh, fruit with these pods and um, the other doesn't. But um, uh, the pods can be eaten when they're young but really really young. You can put them in stir fries and that sort of thing. I've done it but they get tough pretty mm -hmm. early on. I've had some tough stir fries. I just want to say there was a comment in the chat of asking about uh, some of the plants we've been talking about are they perennial or annual and sorry we should have said right at the beginning that I'm pretty sure every plant um, that we've talked we're talking about is either a shrub a tree or a perennial I don't mm -hmm. think we've got any annuals in there sorry we should have said that's true yeah and it's true of most native plants in general there are only a few that I can think of that are annuals and and those ones are typically self seeders like your hmm, well Black eyed Susan, wild columbine can sometimes go for just one year, but they'll pop up again anyways because they probably drop seeds all over the place. Okay, next slide, please. So we're, we've got, I think we're, yeah, we're going on to fruits. Okay, this is what you were probably expecting. Um, starting with how could we ever do a presentation like this without talking about strawberries? Um, they, these are, everybody should be growing strawberries. If you're not already growing wild or woodland strawberries, why are you not growing these plants? They're so adorable. They form a beautiful ground cover type situation. If you have a sunny, uh, dry conditions, then it's the wild Fragaria virginiana that you want to be growing. If you have woodland conditions, it's Fragaria vesca, which is the same species, by the way, as the cultivated European um, strawberry that make the big ones, but we want to be sourcing our plants um, ethically and locally whenever possible because they have, again, those tight co-evolutionary relationships with our, um, our local wildlife. So the strawberries that you're going to get out of these plants are littler. They're only, only little, but they're packed full of flavor. They're like a punch in the face of sweet and sour all at the same time, and it kind of depends on whether you've got a sunny condition or not, but um, you know, I just love strawberries. Everybody should get yourself some strawberries. And by the way, plant them next to your lawn 
and they'll like infiltrate your lawn and you know just fill it in with flowers and fruits and what's not to love <laughs> meanwhile speaking of things that i love oh my gosh service berries this is the first edible native plant that i ever got into and i was like why didn't i not have this in my life for like 20 years tell me about it lorraine <laughs> oh it is one of my favorite uh, small trees which is part of the reason why i think it's really wonderful in urban conditions like it's 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 small it's compact it's covered in white flowers in well right around now so um mid-may it's blooming it's great for the pollinators it's a nectar and pollen source um and then when it gives way when the flowers give way to these fruit prolific fruit all over the tree in in june and um they they taste the fruit tastes a lot like blueberries but with this almond flavor they've got that mm. same kind of almond flavor you there's so much you can do with the fruit the birds love them but since they're so prolific um since the the, the tree produces so much fruit um you can share them with the birds as well you can eat them raw you can um, freeze them for using them later. You can cook them into pies. You can make jellies. You can um, make compost. Basically, anything that you could do with a blueberry, you can do with service berries. They're mm -hmm. fantastic. And they're free fruit all over the city because there are lots of service berries planted as a, as a street tree or in um, just, yeah, uh, just keep an eye out and uh, maybe have a handful on a walk. Absolutely. Um, and I'll say too that um, they're they're a little variable in their mm -hmm. flavor. So one tree and even two trees that look basically the same right next to each other, one of them will have really delicious succulent sweet fruit and the other one, the fruit botanically we would describe it as insipid, which is really just sort of mealy and not not very tasty. So I have a little mental map in my head of where all the most delicious service berry trees are in Toronto. And if you ask me to share it with you, I will not. <laughs> Those are for, no, I'm joking. I, I, was, it's, I love to get a little, a little city harvest of these guys. And of course, leaving many, many for the birds as well. Yeah. Next slide. And that's really a really important point, Ryan, about just to stress the, um, the variability, not just of service berries, but um, because these are wild plants, sort of um, as in they have not been um, tinkered with, let's say, in, by the nursery trade. So they're the straight species. Um, they haven't been genetically altered. That means there's a lot of variability in them. In in all of the species we're talking about. So yeah, mm -hmm. really good, important uh, point to stress. Yeah, uh, yeah. And to another fruit, and this one is pretty much um, my favorite native edible plant in, in, um, in the Carolinian zone. So the pawpaw tree, it's a small tree. It grows um, incredibly well, like it, it suckers, it, uh, it's it's rare in the wild but that's not because it's hard to grow because we're losing mm. habitat so it's an understory tree which means it's uh it can grow in in shade part shade um it's not super tall it's um it's got some really interesting things going for it. it's the larval host plant for the zebra swallowtail butterfly so a rare butterfly um it the pawpaw tree produces the largest native edible fruit in the country mm -hmm. and you can see um, that's my hand in that photo with uh, a pawpaw from my backyard so you can get a sense of how big they are they they're like small mangoes uh, and they taste like a mix of kind of or well again as as we've talked about the variability in flavor but um, they often uh, taste like a mix of banana and pineapple sometimes you know they, there can be other flavors in there too the, the texture is like custard almost and they have large a couple of large seeds sort of in a row um it's also just an incredibly beautiful flower that is in early spring that has a slight slight um odor to it which attracts um flies to it mm -hmm. like there's a special um uh fly that's a, that's attracted to it um, and it's almost tropical looking, as you can see from those leaves, it's, it's hard to believe that this is a native tree, native, and that, 
um, it's not better known. Um, and those fruit, they're hard to trans, like they, it's hard to commercialize uh, mm -hmm. pawpaw. So if you want pawpaws, you can grow, now you have to grow a couple of the trees, at least two, three is better um, for pollination to get fruit, uh, genetically distinct plants. Mm -hmm. So not clones mm -hmm. uh, because it does sucker, but genetically distinct um, parent plants. And uh, you should get fruit within, um, maybe eight to 10 years if you start it now. And I do just want to give a shout out my favorite book about how to grow the pawpaw here. I'm holding oh, it up. Wow. And it's the Pawpaw Grower's Manual for Ontario. And it's written by Dan Bisonet, and it is okay. still available. So you can um, Google it or we can include some information about how to get it. But this is like the resource for growing pawpaws in Ontario. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, and this is definitely another one where I, when I ate it, I was like, I cannot believe that we're talking about a native plant here. Like this, it really tastes like something at a tropical fruit stand or something. It's, uh, it's if you haven't tried it yet, you're in for a treat. Um, meanwhile, elderberry is maybe something that people are a little bit more familiar with because um, it is a Europe, there are European species um, and you know, the flowers are sometimes used to, to flavor various um, liquors or sodas or whatnot but it is also a native plant there are two species native in um, southern ontario and one more species at least um, out west now the important thing about this one is you really want to get the white elderberry the sambucus canadensis which does like wetter spots typically um, and the way to tell the difference this is my little my little trick is it's the way that the flowers grow so you can see in this picture the flowers are really spreading out into a flat shape that you could put your dinner plate on top of, okay? Imagine taking a plate and you could cover all the flowers with your plate. So that means if you can cover the flowers with your dinner plate, then you can put the fruit on your dinner plate. And if it's growing in a different kind of way, which is more of like a pyramid shape type thing, then that's your red elderberry and you do not want to put that on your dinner plate uh, because it will make you sick. That, that one definitely is, um, is, is not a good plant to be eating. So be sure that you've got the right species there. Um, the flowers of this are also edible. Um, people do fry them so you can sort of batter them and then fry them and they make this cool sort of crispy pancake flour thing that is, um, I've tasted one before and it was, it was quite cool. Um, next slide, please. Moving along here, we're, uh, Okay, more fleshy fruits. So raspberries, I'll just, I, peep, everybody knows raspberries, right? I mean, they're, they're a little bit annoying out in the field to have to deal with all of those prickles. The rose family in which the raspberries and blackberries are tend to defend themselves more so with prickly, spiky, ouchy things rather than with um, poisonous chemicals. So that's um, just something to be aware of with the raspberries and blackberries. But um, of course, there's hardly anything better than a, a a great harvest in midsummer um, of raspberries or blackberries in a sunny spot. Um, they're they're great, and you know everybody knows what to do. Um, either just eat them raw, or make a jam, or a pie, or whatever you like. It's uh, just about anything you can do with a with a raspberry. And what about the gooseberries? That's maybe a less commonly known one. Yeah, but it does produce those. Um... Uh, the gooseberry fruit that we're familiar with, um, you know, they start off, uh, the fruit starts off green and then as it matures, it will um, kind of turn um, purplish or reddish or purple. Um, but when it's er the early spring flowers of the gooseberries are incredible pollinator magnets. They're really important for ne uh, nectar and, and pollen sources for bees in spring. Um, it's, this is a really versatile shrub um, for gardens. You can plant it in sun to part shade, uh, dry to moist soil. Um, it can, when it's established, it can be pretty drought tolerant. So it's a really good um, shrub in the garden. It also, it has prickles. So, you know, if you're looking for an area that you want to um, kind of discourage, mm. kind of in a nice way, discourage people from entering or going past this, you can plant the, uh, the prickly gooseberry. One important thing though it, to note is that 
Um, it is the, uh, it's the alternate host for the um, white pine blister rust, which is a really um, serious disease of white pine. So uh, the MNR, the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, their materials, they recommend that you don't plant this species within about a mile at least of a, mm. um, of a white pine, which might be hard to find in the city, but you know, you might find, it might be difficult to get that far away from a white pine is what I mean. So scout out before wow. you uh, before you plant this one. It's like social distancing for plants, <laughs> but like way more. That's fascinating. One thing I forgot to say about the raspberries and blackberries um, in terms of uh, wildlife interactions is a really cool thing about them is that their canes um, are hollow typically. And if you leave them in the garden, that can be a great spot for um, various types of insects to overwinter and survive inside those upright canes. So leave those if you would um, in your garden and, uh, and you'll, you'll be helping provide a little home for various um, creatures. So that's just, just a good thing to do. Next slide, please. I noticed by the way, we're going, we're spending a good chunk of time on these plants, which I think is good. I think people want that. Um, but it may mean we, we skip um, some of the, the later ones, but we're getting here to the end of our plants, um, getting into the dry fruits and some nuts in particular. So I'll start by talking about hazel. Um, as a plant, um, I love the hazels. Whenever I see a hazel, particularly in the early spring, it's one of those things that you gotta look up real close. If you could see my hand there in that top, um, smaller picture there's a little teeny little red thing there which is the female flower of this this hazel shrub and um, the male flowers which form a, a sort of dangly yellow catkin um, are a little bit further up in that photo and that's just one of those signs of spring that i love to see um, if you've got a whole bunch of hazels and the male flowers are sort of dangling down and blowing in the wind it's it's a beautiful thing to see um, as far as the fruit go, we've, so we do have two species, the American and the beaked hazel. And frankly, in the, in, I, I find the, the squirrels have such a nose for the, those nuts that they do tend to get there. Uh, you know, they've got a, a extra sense for when it's just that perfect ripe time. So you may want to consider um, putting some protective netting or mesh around your plants um, as those uh, fruits are, are becoming ripe so that you can get a harvest out of them. But even if you don't, it's just a very beautiful plant. And I, I would say grow it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, the black walnut tree, I mean, how, how could we not include black walnut when, when we're talking about edible um, native plants? So the, the nut it is edible, but it, it have to admit it is a lot of work to get at that nut. I know people who have who drive their cars over the nut to get at it. So it's a lot of work, but uh, it's you can pickle the green nuts. You they're sweet and delicious. Um, and actually, I don't I don't know that a lot of people know that you know we think about uh, um, tapping sugar maples for um, sap and then turning it into syrup. But you know, there are, there are other native trees that you can, we can do that with. Birch is another one. Mm. Walnut, you can do it with walnut and you can do it with hickories. Um, mm. Sorry, just a side note, next slide. And I noticed that there are so yeah. many fantastic comments and questions in the chat and oh, the yeah. Q&A. They're just amazing. I wish we could say so much more about okay. the plant, but. We'll, we will we'll get there. We'll try to get through quickly here. Okay, so so spice bush quickly, very, very cool plant. Leaves smell amazing. The fruits are these little red things that taste like sort of spicy peppercorn. And they're, they're amazing. And here I had to include, okay, we've got a picture of wildlife here, an animal. This is the spice bush swallowtail, which is the, the, um, the, the spice bush is the larval host plant for that creature. So just a little bonus on top of the the yellow flowers the red fruit the delicious smelling leaves you might also get um a, a gorgeous butterfly and caterpillar too and then uh, how about the staghorn sumac yeah a wonderful shrub for a let's say a, a big open area that you where you want something to cover very quickly let's say a sunny slope 
that you don't know what else to plant on, staghorn sumac will create a, a colony there. Um, but the, the fun thing about that, what, I've, um, what I use it for is the fruit. So you can see that, that photo of like the staghorn, that's the fruit, and uh, you can turn it into a really delicious lemonade actually, and it's high in vitamin C. You soak those, those fruit clusters in cold water, about 15 minutes, you strain it and, it, uh, it and add some sugar if you'd like, and it tastes like lemonade. I've also used the, the fine uh, dry kind of hairs on the fruit as, the, as a sumac um, spice actually mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i see that in the comments someone just mentioned is this the same as the middle eastern sumac um i it's probably a different species or at least a different variety but you will get a similar kind of flavor and i've noticed that really high-end um restaurants and chefs are using sumac a lot now because it's it's a the kind of it's an ingredient that can add acidity to a dish without adding liquid which usually you need to add like a citrus mm -hmm. or a vinegar or something like that but sumac has the the um, unique property of being able to add acidity without um, liquid. So you can get some really cool dishes that way. Um, all right, next slide. Let's, let's pick up the pace here. Okay, so here's just a quick, quick plug for our gar garden guides here. Um, these are some great resources. You can learn lots and lots more about um, gardening for wildlife. In each of these gar guides, they're divided by habitat type. So if you have a shady spot, consider putting in the time and the effort um, to make yourself a, a restored woodland. If you've got a sunny area, a wildflower meadow is in your future. And um, if you really want to go in a sort of different kind of direction, um, a water garden is a really interesting thing that you can do as well. Now, in the interest of time, we had talked about, we were going to do some combos, some sort of thinking about plants that do well in similar garden conditions, but I think maybe we should go straight to question and answer. Yeah, okay, I'm but, seeing nods, I'm seeing nods, so. But maybe with a brief through the recipes, just to yeah. show, yeah. Let's do this. Okay, so we, we went appetizer first, so this was my, um, my sunchokes here that I just, uh, all I did here is I salt and peppered them, olive oil, roasted, um, chopped them in half, and then I, I got some, I made a little sort of creamy dip in the middle, and that was a delicious appetizer. So definitely recommend that. <laughs> Next up, we've got dinner. Uh, which Brain. is uh, my friend Debbie, uh, does a lot of cooking with uh, wild leeks here. She's made some wild leek pesto for a pasta and a wild leek tart. So a ramps, a ramps meal. And then uh, next slide. Dessert. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, all of these fruits we've been talking, or most of the fruits we've been talking about can be turned in. So on the left, elderberry pie, and on the right, a service berry pie. Delicious, oh, and mouth watering. <laughs> and then something a little different after dinner. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, on the left there is actually a, a wild leek or ramps, pickled ramps martini on the left. Uh, and then in the middle is a wild ginger syrup. You can make um, a wild ginger syrup. You just chop up the leaves and the root and boil them with water with about one to three ratio of sugar to water and uh, you get a syrup and this is a bourbon uh, orange uh, wild ginger cocktail and then pickled leeks on the right amazing and i'll add to this uh this list of recipes for cocktails i've made um, a mojito that i have to say virginia mountain mint um does a very good mojito muddled up um it's it's good it adds a little bit of you get that minty flavor but a little uh, hint of lavender flavor or something like that going on too. It's a, a that'll really wow your dinner guests. I promise. <laughs> All right, and with that, I think we will just wrap things up here. So these are our resources. You've seen them many times. That one at the top is the same thing that's right here that happens to be written by <laughs> um, Lorraine here. One of this is actually the book that really got me into native plant gardening myself. So I have to say it's a pretty special moment right now to be able to, to have this webinar together with Lorraine. Um, so you've seen these references before. Do dig in, you'll learn all kinds of things. The next slide is all about 
um, web resources. Again, um, these will be posted. You'll see them in the recordings and um, you could spend hours and hours and hours just learning all sorts of different things um, at these different websites. And with that, I think that's, those are, that's how to get in touch with us if you would like to do so. Emily, why don't you wrap us up? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Ryan and Lorraine, for a great presentation. I'm a little bit hungry now. I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have one more webinar coming up in our Garden for Wildlife series. We are excited to have Dr. Doug Ptolemy join us. He's going to be talking about his new book and how your garden can create corridors for wildlife. You can register at wwf.ca and you can also watch previous webinars if you miss them on YouTube at um, YouTube slash WWF Canada, and you can catch them there. And for those of you who are interested in joining our In the Zone Gardens program, you can register your garden. And when you do that, it's helping us track the amount of habitat that we are adding back to the region, um, which is a great citizen science effort. So to the, our questions, and I have a question actually for both of you, Ryan and Lorraine. Can you tell us what your favorite edible plant is? Oh, I can't pick one. I'm sorry, I can't. I think I said about three different times in this presentation, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, <laughs> I guess I have to say Papa because it just has so many amazing things going for it. But uh, you know, who doesn't love fiddlehead ferns? Anything that announces mm -hmm. spring and then Jerusalem, um, sun chokes for that announce fall, you know, to be eating the sunchoke tubers in the fall. Sorry, can't pick one fate. Oh, and then the raspberries. <laughs> the yeah. and the, it's, uh, it's sorry. Tough. Yeah, there's sort of every season, I feel like I have a new favorite one, but um, I think the, the service berries really do it for me. Um, like discovering that I had been walking past this delicious thing uh, basically all my life and just didn't realize what a treasure that is it was quite a revelation and then i have to say too especially for if anyone's just starting out wanted to try this for the first time i really would recommend that nodding wild onion um it's easy peasy to grow and also i don't know exactly how true this is but people do say that uh, members of the onion family are great for deterring um mammals so uh so squirrels and whatnot do not like the smell of onions so perhaps um growing those in and amongst your other plants would be a, a, a good little little wildlife deterrent if that's something that you're worried about. Yeah and actually if I could add maybe I, I do have um, some favorites that we we did not include in this presentation we didn't have time to include all of them. Um, wild grape is amazing and it can yeah. be it can be incredibly variable in the flavor just really want to stress that there is the genetic biodiversity within these plants within mm -hmm. these straight species and so you know i've had wild grapes that are just the most delicious ever you just want to eat them off the vine um so that's a favorite wild plum we have a native mm. wild plum here in uh in the carolinian zones so how fantastic is that and another amazing uh edible uh, native plant or the ground cherry, a native ground cherry here in Ontario. We've got a couple of them. So uh, you can see we could have gone on forever and ever here. And this was, I have to say, we made a list that's probably double this size and had to yeah. pare it down to get to this presentation. Yeah. Have us back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's so hard to choose. Um, so a question that I've seen come in a few times from people is wondering where you can get seeds for these edible plants or where you can hmm. get the plants so that you can start cultivating your own. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll say for one thing, um, growing, most people do not actually grow perennials from seed. So I wanna emphasize that most of the time when people are growing plants from seed, those are annuals, they're fast growers. So I'm growing some perennial native plants from seed and they're this big now after a couple of uh, months uh, of stratifying and, and uh, germinating and whatnot. So it, it is something that you can do, but it's a long haul journey for sure. Um, if you wanted to get a harvest this year, I highly recommend starting with plants in minimum sort of four inch pot size. Um, of course, Emily, you mentioned our Loblaw um, relationship, the, the, the rollout of 
plants with the native plant tag in Loblaws garden centers around Southern Ontario. So for the first time ever, you can get some of these kinds of plants um, at those locations. Otherwise, I highly recommend you check out the North American Native Plant Society um, and their list of commercial growers from across Canada and actually even into the United States. So maybe our 10 people uh, from the US could visit that site as well and find some, um, some growers who really specialize in the local um, genetic variation. Uh, and there's, as I mentioned previously, there really is no um, substitute for that. It is the gold standard and um, and they're also just uh, they're lovely people, very knowledgeable, and they'll help you out picking the right plants for your space. Great, thank you so much. And another question that I've been seeing come in is asking, how do you make sure you don't poison your dinner guests mm. by using a plant that you've gotten too late, so it's too ripe, or by identifying it incorrectly or cooking it improperly? Okay. Um, we haven't included any plants that will poison you um, if you harvest them too late. They might not taste so good um, mm -hmm. too late. Um, we did the one, the one uh, plant I think I mentioned with the fiddlehead ferns, it's uh, you might want to make sure that uh, you're not, you don't have a bad reaction when they're undercooked. So that's one plant. And then we also, we did include the false Solomon seal berries, which um, although some people eat them, they are also uh, considered mildly cathartic. So, you know, um, uh, for, for uh, some people do have a reaction to them. But other than that, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think, uh, I think none of the plants we included will, um, uh, will be a problem even if you eat them, harvest them too late. They just won't be delicious. Yeah, that's true. Uh, of the plants that we chose, we were careful in that sense. If you're thinking more sort of broadly about oh, native, native plants and, and just if you want to educate yourself about the, points, the plants that are poisonous, which I think is a very sensible thing to do, to be honest. Um, it's good to know and to be able to recognize and teach people those plants. And I wanted to share a resource for across Canada, which is called the Canadian Poison Plants Information System. It's a Government of Canada website, which is a really great resource that goes plant by plant. Um, you'll have to learn how to identify them separately, but if you know the name of it, if you can figure out, you got into your field guide, you figured out the name of it, it has tons and tons of information about um, the poisonous parts and whether it's poisonous to people or to, um, to cats or dogs, that might be something that you're interested in knowing, or to sheep or goats or cows or horses or any other kind of creature. It's all in there. Um, so I would, I would take a look. Again, that's the Canadian Poisonous Plants Information System. Great website. Okay, and one of my favorite resources is actually this uh, Peterson Field Guide to the Edible Ooh, Wild Plants. And it good. does, it includes information about um, the plant parts that are not edible that might be a problem as well. So although its focus is not uh, plants that will poison you, it does include warnings about um, poisonous parts of some plants that otherwise are edible. So that's another good resource. Good, good. Okay, and while we're doing book show and tell, I have another one, <laughs> which is this one here, um, Edible Wild Fruits and Nuts of Canada. And I just noticed this morning when I pulled this off my shelf that it is, it is um, volume three. So I presume that there's others that I should have too. Um, and this is a really great one. It includes um, recipes in it and it has a section in the front too about sort of taking caution and how to, uh, how to keep yourself safe. It's, it is a safe thing to eat native plants, um, but there are certain risks associated that it makes sense to educate yourself. So definitely, um, you know, keep that in mind for sure. Okay, let's take yeah. some more questions. <laughs> Great. So I just did a poll with everybody to see how many of you have harvested native plants before. And we had a very even 50-50 okay. split, Good to which know. is really cool. And um, when, you asked, when you asked about harvesting native plants before, did you mean from the garden? So um, I didn't specify in the question. I think, hmm. I hope it was implied it was from the garden. Okay. Um, I have a question from Lindsay that's for you, Lorraine. Um, is there really no substitution to native plants? Um, if our goal is to help pollinators, you know, can we use alternatives? 
Right, and I think, I, yeah, I, re I remember seeing that uh, question float by in the Q&A and it had to do with cultivars as well. Yes. Like, is it okay to choose a cultivar of a native plant? Will it have the same um, uh, wildlife value, especially for pollinators? Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, you know, that's a huge question and we could spend a whole seminar discussing only that question, but um, I guess, if it's only a cultivar that's available, as in the question that was asked, it had to do with, um, I think, uh, uh, was someone from Alberta asking the question about a native crocus that you cannot buy in a nursery, but you can buy cultivars of it. So in an instance like that, yeah, why not? Um, there's, there's definitely mixed research out there regarding the comparative value of the cultivar to the straight species. Um, in terms of uh, pollinator value. It's mixed and it depends on species and there's not a ton of research done on that. So I guess, you know, if you have a choice and like why not, and, and supporting pollinators is one of your goals as well, I would recommend going for the straight species. Um, but uh, let's say, you know, there's uh, the straight species isn't available for some reason in the nursery trade or you really love some special feature of a cultivar just know that it won't necessarily have the same wildlife value let's say if it's got double flowers like and so the pollinators can actually get at the the nectar or pollen of some of those species so that's um uh, that's the short answer of a very complex and fascinating question if I am allowed to jump in, so I know it wasn't a question for me, but it's, it is a great question and one that everyone should be having and we should be having this discussion often. Um, the part that having studied genetic variation and evolutionary biology, the, the part of this conversation that's most interesting to me is about um, biodiversity and, and genetic variation within these species. So we know that the wild species have very diverse genes across within populations, across populations. And I wonder just how will um, horticultural practices be able to replicate that? Um, are they considering it or are they whittling that genetic variation down? And if that is the case, I start to become worried a little bit because um, genetic variation is the fuel for natural selection. It's what allows plants and other creatures to be able to adapt to changing conditions we are experiencing changing conditions right now in a very big way. And so I want that variation. I want to preserve it. I want to bolster it in every way that I possibly can. Um, that's my view on, on that question. Yeah, really important aspect to it for sure, Ryan, because the nursery practices are often around um, cloning. So the, 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 the each named cultivar is genetically identical in, in most cases uh, to the other, you know, the same species, and that's not g genetic diversity across the landscape. Right, thank you. And we have a question now about garlic mustard. Um, Jennifer mm. says that it's abundant in her yard this year and is wondering if it should be harvested to eat or just pull it up. Go for it, Lorraine. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, garlic mustard is a non-native plant um, and it's one that suppresses the growth of uh, other plants and in woodlands, for example, it kind of creates monoculture of a non-native species and suppresses the growth of um, a diversity of native plants in the understory of that woodland. Um, and also, you know, it, it grows all over the place. Um, it's in, um, it has those white flowers. You can see it everywhere. So I really recommend, I am a big proponent of eating your weeds. So the plants you don't want, if they are edible, now you have to do a bit of research for each species. They're not all edible, but um, garlic mustard happens to be a very edible uh, non-native plant. And I highly recommend harvesting the leaves actually when they're young and right about now it's a biennial plant. So um, it uh, produces leaves uh, uh, the first year and then it doesn't flower until the second year, but harvest those leaves when they're young and you can uh, turn them into a fabulous pesto. You can add them to soups and stews. They have an oniony garlicky flavor. Um, and I would actually say that you could do both. Like you could pull it up by the root and like it's not an either or, pull it up by the roots and then um, cut off the young leaves and eat them in some way. 
Um, I've even cooked them like spinach sometimes mixed with other things. Um, and then plant, um, you know, whatever native plants you're interested in, in, in the area that you have removed the garlic mustard from. Mm -hmm. Nothing to add there. That's all it. Mm -hmm. Eat those invasives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, another one actually is uh, Japanese knotweed, another uh, non-native plant that causes a lot of problems. And you can you can eat those young shoots. Actually, they're a bit rhubarby. They're quite uh, tangy. I've heard even with that one, there's a big sort of hubbub about um, Japanese knotweed um, having high levels of resveratrol, which is one of those chemicals that people are very excited about for life preserving anyway it's it's one of those weird things that like when i see that plant i go like Ooh, oh my goodness but some people would see that and go oh my gosh there's a there's a load of cash i could sell that on the internet for <laughs> hundreds of dollars <laughs> anyway let's take another question great so we have a few questions about service berries so i'm going to try to just throw them all at you at the same time um the first one is do you need two plants to pollinate with service berries you know what the great thing about service berries is that they are all over they are all over the city they are so close the, like you can plant just one service berry and you are going to get a ton of fruit so um uh do not you know it's so something like a pawpaw where you have to uh, plant a couple to ensure that you're going to get fruit with service berry do not worry at all Great. And the second part of this question is asking how much shade the service berries can tolerate and whether they can mm. grow under a Norway maple. Mm. Do you want to answer, Ryan? Sorry. Well, uh, my, I mean, my answer is going to be a very, um, it depends on the species. There's a lot of different species of, of service berries, some of which are, grow in as forest understory, some of them grow at forest edge, some of them grow in more of a, a meadow or a um, an open kind of condition. So I would pay attention to that when you're at the nursery, pay attention to those, those species. Um, but is there one in particular that you can think of, Lorraine, that would do under full shade? You know, I, I have never had, so I've got one growing in um, uh, kind of shady conditions out back and then one growing out front in very sunny conditions. And I really, the difference in the amount of fruit harvested is huge. Okay. Both trees are actually doing, both trees are actually alive hmm. and doing all kinds of important things in terms of habitat and, um, uh, and just sort of garden value. But in terms of the edibility, the mm -hmm. sun is the, yeah. Well, and that, that reminds me of a really important point. We can back up a little bit and just remember that plants turn sunlight into energy, into stuff like sugar. And so it's not surprising to me at all to find that a plant in a sunnier spot, it's just got more energy so it can make more sugar. Uh, a plant in a shadier spot is going to take a longer time to make those sugars and it's probably not going to be able to make as many. So remember our basic botany folks when you're thinking about this. <laughs> Uh, although there's a there's a nice comment in the chat from David who says I grow Emelanchier on al the folia under a Norway maple and it does well. There you go. Thank you, Thank you David. Chat to the rescue. Yes. <laughs> Let's That's take great. another one. Yeah. Can we so, keep going for like forever? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're we have about ten more minutes left to go, so we'll try okay. to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, we'll try to group them together. So now we are into the, the paw paw. Mm. Um, the first question is about when you can harvest the fruit. Now, it, paw paw produces the um, sorry the fruit is ripe and ready. For for harvest quite late in the season actually like it can be it can be early October it can be mid-October even that you're still it's still good to harvest them so um, they do uh, they do take a long time to get to harvestability and the issue with pawpaws really is that other creatures squirrels and raccoons really like just like pushing those pawpaws off the tree. They, they treat them like baseballs or something. They're just like, 
um, and taking little bites out of them. So it's really hard to, um, like you have to, you might lose some of your harvest um, because they're also, they get very scented mm. when they're very strongly scented when they are ready to harvest and all the other creatures are smelling that too. So um, yeah, late, they're late season. Okay, great. And in terms of where they grow and fruit, we've had some questions about whether you could grow them in Calgary or BC and how far north you could grow them. Hmm. Well, um, I think of it as a Carolinian species particularly. So I think Southern Ontario and when you get up to Toronto, you're probably fairly close to the northern extent of its range. Um, you know, climate is changing, so that might change too. But I, unfortunately, I think for that, that particular treat, you might have to come join us down here in the Carolinian zone. <laughs> now, I have heard, and you know, I, sh I should have checked this list before this seminar, because I do keep track of um, any reference I hear to a pawpaw being grown outside of its native range, which, as Ryan says, is southern Ontario, the Carolinian zone. Um, and I am pretty sure that I have heard about pawpaws that are actually growing in protected spaces. Now, pawpaws really don't like wind. Um, mm. they, they really like to be in protected spots. So I've heard about them almost as far, uh, and this is not like tons and tons of them, but just some, someone who is growing it um, almost as far as Ottawa. Mm. Um, but, you know, maybe that's a fluke, a fluke of a microclimate. I'm pretty sure I've heard of some growing in um, Prince Edward County, again, a kind of protected, you know, in a protected spot. Mm -hmm. So their native region uh, uh, for, is, their native area is the Carolinian zone. But um, yeah, I have heard of people pushing that um, a, a bit farther north and really, I guess, having a protected area and really um, having some success. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just saw a comment pop up from Bernadette who says the Loblaws in Richmond Hill um, has a good looking selection of native plants that look really healthy. That's, that's, I'm really glad to hear that. I know I, there's at least one Loblaw Center in Richmond Hill, Hill that is part of our project. So when you go there, just make sure you take a close look and, and find our tag. It'll have a panda on it. It'll have in the zone on it. And if you've got that, those are the gold standard, absolute best native plants you can possibly find. Great, that's awesome to hear. Um, another question we have come in for Mitchell is asking, I heard that red elderberry is edible as long as you cook the berries. Is that true? And when it comes to the black elderberries, um, do you have to cook those as well? Um, Lorraine, think... do, you have, do you have a comment about the red? I, I think the, the black are the ones that are out in the Pacific and I have, they're in this book, so I could look it up real quick if you, <laughs> while you talk about red. Yeah, and you know what, there are a lot, uh, that I'm really glad um, that that question was asked because I know that there are a lot of um, sort of, there's a lot of conflicting information out there about some, um, some plants and I think the red, elderberry is a very good example of that, the black elderberry. So um, I would not feel comfortable weighing in on that mm -hmm. right, um, right now. I would say um, about all of these, if, if you are thinking about planting an elderberry, let's say, I've just picked that one, um, uh, because you want to eat the berries, be very, um, do some research, and also make sure at the nursery, like discuss, go to a native plant nursery, a specialty nursery, and we've talked about where to find that list of uh, specialty native plant nurseries. I know the Halton Master Gardeners um, have a really good thorough list of native plant nurseries on their website as well. So it's the Halton Master Gardeners. Um, and as Ryan said, NAMP, North American Native Plant Society does as well. Um, so be sure, you know, ask at the nursery and tell them you want to eat this, you want to eat the fruit. So you want to be sure um, it is the, the edible, you want to be sure of the identification of the, uh, of the 
particular species. Mm -hmm. um, but this, I, this question about are there some that you can cook uh, and make them edible, we also did not include may apple in this um, in this presentation. Uh, so Podophyllum peltatum, a great ground cover for shade, you see it in the woods, and it produces this um, uh, fruit. Um, it's, look, it's like an apple-like fruit. And again, there's like a lot of conflicting information out there around its edibility and, you know, whether or not um, uh, it's a good idea to eat it. So a lot of sources, though, say it is okay to cook it. It's, it's fine to eat it cooked, like in a jam or a jelly. Um, but anyway, Ryan, have you, uh, have you well, been doing some investigation? Yeah, and it's, it's, I am getting the same thing about the elderberries. It, it's, it's, there's conflicting stuff out there. So I would say stick to the white elderberry, <laughs> the dinner plate, you know, you got your dinner plate situation. And it does seem that the flowers are, are safe um, for sure. So, so, but yeah, research, research, research. And if, if in doubt, you know, we talked about the taste test, you can, you know, put a little bit on your tongue or on your lips, see, wait a bit, um, taste a little bit, wait. That's just general good, good practice um, if you're worried about this kind of thing. And for allergies too, like frankly, we don't know if any of you have allergies to a particular kind of plant, no way that we can possibly predict that. So I know people with lots of allergies and that's how they treat new foods. And that seems like a prudent way to go, go about it. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. And we are at time. So I'm just gonna ask Ryan one more question and then okay. we can wrap things up because you are our balcony gardening guru. What edible plants do really well on a balcony? So the nodding wild onion for absolutely sure. Um, I did, uh, again, the sun chokes, the Jerusalem artichokes, Helianthus tuberosa, did very well in my container. Um, the Pycnanthemum virginianum, uh, Virginia Mountain Mint, really good. Uh, I did, I've done some of the hyssops, which are nice um, to make an infusion for tea. Um, and actually just this morning, I also made an infusion of sweetgrass, which grows really well in a container too. So I would recommend any of those to get started with. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan and Lorraine for all of your expertise on edible native plants. And thank you everybody for joining us today and for staying on the line to learn more about this. Again, you can register your garden at inthezonegardens.com and we'll also, or sorry, .ca. And we also have a great newsletter that we send out monthly where you can get a ton more information about this. Anyways, enjoy your weekend and the beautiful weather and hopefully we'll see you on Tuesday for a final webinar. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.